But we begin tonight with the supersized panic of the American right. Post-Obama backlash may have escalated the panic more than 10 years ago. But then Donald Trump poured the freak out with gasoline. It was Trump who unveiled the racism and misogyny that was always there, but threw it wide open, normalized the depths of the country's prejudice, even made it fashionable for conservatives. Their vision of America crystallized online, within our government, too, the post-Trump age of open fascism. We saw open demonstrations of hate from white nationalists using tiki torches to light up Charlottesville, to the attempted Confederate takeover of the Capitol. Once the Pandora's box of bigotry is open, things get out of control quickly and in a horrifying way. People don't even feel bad about their anti-blackness these days. They are grossly, actually kind of proud of it. Case in point, Dilbert, the widely syndicated comic strip about office culture that appeared in 2,000 newspapers around the world. You may be familiar with the comic, but maybe not its creator, Scott Adams. Frankly, I had no idea who the guy was. <laughs> well until he went on a racist rant on YouTube last Wednesday. I think it makes no sense whatsoever as a uh, white citizen of America to try to help black citizens anymore. So I'm, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna back off from being helpful to black America because it doesn't seem like it pays off. If you know, nearly half of all blacks uh, are not okay with white people, according to this poll, not according to me, according to this poll, uh, that's a hate group. That's a hate group. And I don't want to have anything to do with them. Oh, how will black folk ever survive without you, whoever you are? Oh, okay, there is a lot to unpack there. The unabashed anti-blackness and racism, but also this country's long history of dubbing black people as the hateful, violent ones, while also exposing this weird offensive belief that white people need to get something out of helping others. And again, what has this guy ever done for anyone that, that's black? Anyway. Hundreds of newspapers, including the Washington Post, New York Times, Los Angeles Times, and USA Today, announced that they would stop publishing Dilbert after Adam's tirade. Also, that part the Dilbert guy mentioned about a poll, he was talking about a poll by Rasmussen Reports, the right-wing polling outfit, that found 53% of black Americans agreed with the statement, it's okay to be white. I mean, why would a poll even ask that? Oh, because it's Rasmussen, of course, the agenda-driven conspiracy theory-boosting pollster who loves to stir the pot in the culture war. The phrase, it's okay to be white, by the way, has been labeled a hate slogan by the Anti-Defamation League, a slogan popularized as a trolling campaign by members of 4chan. The poll also found that 66% of black Americans agree black people can be racist, too. A poll, mind you, that they surveyed about a thousand people, exactly a thousand people, actually. Meaning, uh, sorry, how many black people said this? Well, if they go by population, that would be 12. They, they surveyed 12 black people. In a move that surprised no one, Twitter destroyed Elon Musk when he defended the Dilbert creator, saying that it's actually the media that's racist against whites and Asians. But a story about a cartoon creator becoming the voice of the great white male freakout doesn't end at Dilbert or even at Elon Musk. It ends, or rather begins, with white grievance politics potentially becoming U.S. federal policy. If Florida Governor Ron DeSantis becomes president of the United States, which he is clearly aiming for, America will become the land of total government control over women's bodies, black history, gender identity, how you can teach, learn, read, think, even talk. It would essentially be a more functionally authoritarian version of Trump, a more action, less personality type of president, who's basically offering two options pre-civil rights America, or total control of society. But of course, his robust PR team has you thinking quite the opposite, which is why his new book titled, and I'm not making this up, The Courage to be Free. <laughs> the Courage to be Free. As a first-hand account, from the blue-collar boy with a dream to take down Disney and librarians. It got scorched by the New York Times, obviously. Its reviewers saying, quote, all the culture war mad libs can't distract from the dull coldness at this book's core, <laughs> and that it will leave some supporters who have encouraged DeSantis to humanize himself sorely disappointed. The world DeSantis is building, the reviewer said, down in Florida, is one that uses the power of government to make the Dilbert guys of the world feel comfortable. They feel good about themselves, centered, you know. Did you know that this isn't even Baby Maga's first book? He also penned Dreams from Our Founding Fathers, published in 2011. And it pretty much sums up what we already know about the guy. 
David Waldstreicher wrote about the book in The Atlantic, saying the most revealing and consequential element of the book is the insistence that the role of slavery and race more broadly does not seriously change anything about how we should understand the birth and development of our country. Joining me now is the author of that article, David Waldstreicher, history professor at the university, at the City University of New York's Graduate Center, and Christina Greer, associate professor of political science at Fordham University. Thank you both for being here. And Mr. Waldstreicher, I want to first make sure I said your name correctly. Did I indeed? Yes, thank you. I'm in the wrong. I'm in the wrong camera. Let me make sure I'm in the right camera first. Okay, so let me start by asking you about this, about the first book that that DeSantis wrote, because he's written this new book, which I think the title is hilarious. The first book was meant to be a response to dreams from my father, dreams of, dreams from my father, which was Barack Obama's book. So he thought himself at the level where he ought to respond to Barack Obama. What did that book reveal about Ron DeSantis's worldview? Well, it for one thing. It was a. It reveals that he was quite certain that he was a similar figure to Barack Obama, <laughs> in the sense of rising from uh, uh, obscurity uh, and not being well known to wanting to run for Congress and being able to maybe do this by writing a book that. Uh, made an important statement about yeah. what the current what the current president got wrong and what what he got what he got right. And similarly to President Obama, DeSantis went to uh, an Ivy League school and then he went to Harvard Law School and he felt that he knew enough to uh, um, have something to say about the about the founding fathers and its relevance for our politics. It, let me, so let me sense, stop you right there. Just, just a sense. Yeah, because it's what he said. And your, your piece is really fascinating because it's what he said about the founding fathers that I found fascinating in your review of it, that he seemed to simultaneously believe that the founding fathers prime directive was to protect the right of property. But he also also believed that that had nothing to do with slavery and no one should ever think about slavery in that guise. But the bottom line is these, these men wrote slavery into the Constitution and wrote a system that fundamentally protected their property rights in slaves and in plantations, which is where they derived their wealth. These two things seem to be a complete contradiction. Yes, they are. Uh, that's exactly it. And there's a... Uh... The extremity by which he says that the only thing we need to know about the founding fathers uh, and the American Revolution with respect to slavery is that they were they were really against it. They believed it was wrong, and their idealism then had later had fruits. So that even though it was impossible, he says, to possibly end, end slavery at the time of the founding, that nevertheless, the only thing you need to know is that they really wanted to end, and eventually it got ended, thanks to fealty to the ideals of the founders. And anything else we might want to say about the role of slavery in the 18th century or the 19th century is... Uh, just bashing the founding fathers to pursue a uh, what he would now call a woke agenda. He didn't yeah. use the term 10 years ago. So, so Christina, I want to bring you in here because I, I think that this is, it explains a lot about DeSantis, about the way he taught high school and what his students said about him and his sort of sense of self-importance. Uh, but also this idea that the people who constructed the Constitution constructed a system designed to make themselves poor, designed to eventually rob them of the very thing that made them rich, and that they somehow had a secret plan that they didn't write in the Constitution, that they didn't write in their letters, that they kept out of all written text, but that somehow they had this secret plan. And the only people who really know it are modern-day Americans like Ron DeSantis, whose roots don't even go to them. Ron DeSantis's people came here in the early 1900s. In the 20th century, he was from a disfavored group. His family was almost kept out because they were Italian, who were considered lower whites, who were not wanted in this country. The Founding Fathers didn't even include him in their vision of America. And yet, he's like, don't besmirch the Founding Fathers. I mean... Alice, uh, I mean, the, 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 this man has literally... Angela Davis has more ties... <laughs> to the pilgrims. Right. I mean, she had, like, right. literal direct ties to the pilgrims. Yeah. He has none. <laughs> and yet he's like, don't besmirch the founding fathers. Your thoughts. Right. Well, I mean, Joy, there there's so many things to unpack with Ron DeSantis, right? One, we know that he has ambitions that are much greater than Florida. This is why we must take very seriously all of his attacks, not just on education and curriculum and African-American studies, but his worldview 
of what he thinks of immigrants, right? His, his grandparents and great grandparents came here uh, and didn't speak English uh, yet. And still we see how he treats, uh, you know, refugees and migrants who are coming to the state of Florida and shipping them all over the Northeast uh, in freezing conditions. So we, we, we've seen what he is capable of. But this rewriting of history, Joy, this this reimagining of these, you know, these sort of good men who just had this like minor inconvenience that, you know, we're just we're being histrionic and talking about U.S. chattel slavery. We cannot forget that George Washington plucked out the teeth of his enslaved Africans and put them in his mouth. We cannot forget that he did not. None of these guys freed their enslaved Africans once they died, even when they said they would. They still did not. We cannot forget about the rape and the murder and the the trafficking of not just individuals, but full on families and communities. So the fact that Ron DeSantis wants to erase all of that very concrete history that links black and white America together from any educational system in the state of Florida. And as he sets his sights on a, a larger national picture in the United States, he wants to erase that entire narrative and make it just, you know, these sort of hardworking white men, which he now sees himself uh, a part of, which you have so clearly laid out. He would not have been a part of that narrative. He would not have been a part of that group. But what's so dangerous and scary is that he wants to be a part of that group. He wants yeah. to be a part of, you know, these men who sort of created these systems, institutional systems that we still see the vestiges of today in so many of our policies and practices across the United States, especially well, I mean, in how they affect black communities. Well, we've talked about how Italians were eventually inducted into, into, into the white space and into the white community. Eventually, they were excluded, but they eventually were let in. One thing I do want to ask you, um, Christina, you are a student of history. How many, since, you know, secretly uh, Thomas Jefferson really hated slavery, how many slaves, do you know how many slaves he actually manumitted during his lifetime? How many did he free? I don't know. No. Uh, but I...